Well, good afternoon, folks, <clears throat> on this really extraordinary historic day. Um, in a minute or two, I'm changing the subject a bit because this is, there's so many major historic moments in American history that are happening on today, this very day. The past two weeks, I think during the past two weeks, we've had about eight different major historic events, any one of which would be dominating the news. So I'm gonna spend, uh, uh, in a couple of minutes, we're gonna start with that. <clears throat> but a quick review of what we did last week. Last week, the question was, what have African-Americans contributed to this country? What have the slaves contributed to our country? Um, first of all, the labor in the cotton fields, the other plantations, but especially the cotton fields, produced an enormous amount of wealth for the southern, for the southern states. Um, Louisiana was the richest state in the Union for a while. And then the cotton exported to New England, to the north, to the cotton mills, began the um, mill and factory, began industry in the north, and the north profited enormously also, as did England. So in a, in a way, the, uh, you can make a good case that the African-American slaves built this country. They built the economy of the uh, English colony and then colonies and then uh, states. We also learned that slaves built a lot of major buildings, historic buildings. Slaves built the White House. Slaves built the Washington Monument, the first, the lower third of it. They built a lot of manor houses on the plantations and most relevant to the moment, slaves built the Capitol building in Washington, DC. In fact, at the extraordinary inauguration ceremonies this morning, they were extraordinarily moving ceremonies. The, uh, the benediction at the end given by the, um, the pastor in Wilmington, uh, Delaware, pastor of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, a longtime friend of President, President Biden, first time I've been able to say that. He mentioned that the, the Capitol building where they were was built by slaves. And that was remarkable. First time I've heard anybody recognize that. It has not been well known. Um, one other, just something I'd like to add to last week. Uh, we spent a lot of time with George Floyd and his influence. Um, one of you told me about an African, a prominent African American who watched the video of George Floyd being killed. And he said uh, at the hands of the police, and he cried. And he said, he was crying because, not just because George Floyd was being murdered, um, but it was a metaphor for what the blacks in America have experienced for centuries. The white men, the white man on the neck of the black, a metaphor for the black experience in this country. A white man on the neck of the black. This is a reminder that uh, racism has been endemic, has been uh, systematic and built into the DNA of our culture here in America for 400 years. Okay, <clears throat> um, today we can go to the first picture. Today, the inauguration is the climax of two weeks of extraordinary historic events, major historic events. And if you looked at the outline ahead of time, I list, um, I think six of them, but now I've added a couple more than eight. So let's look at them one at a time. 
here we have the former president, uh, Donald Trump. Um, this has been a major historic event that the storming of the Capitol building uh, urged on by President, former President Trump was an attempt to overthrow the results of the recent election and replace our democracy with one man rule, with autocracy. That is to say, de facto dictatorship. That was an extraordinary, important moment in American history that we did survive. And during the speakers at the inauguration today, many of them referred to the fact that democracy, this is a huge day because democracy has survived a serious invasion um, of, oops, here you see this, uh, of the Capitol. In this picture, you see thousands. There were no definite number, but as many as 35,000 uh, followers are being addressed by Trump right here. You can see the Washington Monument in the background. All kinds of uh, militia groups came, um, neo-Nazis, a lot of uh, white supremacy groups. And we just learned yesterday in the news, uh, a group called the Oath Takers had been trained not only, they were well-organized, well-trained, mostly former uh, military veterans or former police officers, but they were well-trained, well-organized for the assault on the Capitol building. So there were several of the groups that were well-prepared, well-planned. And at this, um, here's a front page, as we saw last week, showing the, the riot at uh, January the 6th. We also, this is astonishing piece of news that I read in the New York Times yesterday, that the Capitol Police actually helped break down a barrier, open up a barrier between the, uh, the intruders and the Capitol building. Uh, there's a lot to be more to be learned about that. So what was the purpose of Trump's rally near the White House back at the Ellipse? It was no secret at all. It was very open. It had been inviting groups for uh, some time. The purpose was to overthrow the election of 2020, to overthrow the 81 million votes for Joe Biden and replace Joe Biden with a one-man rule. Um, to replace our democracy with an autocracy, one man rule, a virtual dictatorship. And what's horrifying is how many Americans um, agreed what happened for two and a half months since the election, uh, Trump has been repeating the, the big lie. I won the election, I won the election. It was a stolen election and uh, in the past six weeks, gradually, one by one, more Republicans started believing that lie. Now, here it is. I'm going to quote um, Donald Trump at this speech, this rally up near the White House. Very, his message is very clear. Quote, we got to get rid of, that's a quote, by the way, not my grammatical slip out. We got to get rid of the weak Congress people, the ones that aren't any good. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And near the end of his speech, Trump said, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You've got to show strength. You've got to be strong. So there's no doubt about the purpose of the rally. Um, a few pictures. Here's one of the main doors into the Capitol building with the windows broken. And here we have the uh, rioters are storming through the halls 
of the Capitol. Now, this is one of several people who were carrying a Confederate flag uh, with the Capitol policeman standing there as an observer. The Confederate flag, there's no doubt in anybody's mind in the South, certainly, about what the Confederate flag stands for. It's a symbol of the old plantation days of the Confederacy, the slave society, where the blacks were kept in slavery and then kept in a subservient, su suppressed status. Um, and never has the Confederate flag been paraded through the white, through the Capitol building before until this horrifying storming of January the 6th. Not even during the Civil War were the Confederates able to carry their flag into the Capitol building. Uh, there was one, it came close, there was close call during the Civil War in 1862 when Robert E. Lee's army was near Richmond, Virginia and the Union Army, Lincoln, Lincoln had approved of General McCall and taking the Lincoln, the, uh, the Union Army down to the peninsula and try to conquer Richmond, invade Richmond from, uh, from the uh, peninsula. But Lincoln kept just enough American troops at Washington, D.C., but it was basically wide open between uh, Robert Lee's army exactly 100 miles north to Washington, D.C. Anyway, that, that was a close, could have been a close call, but only two weeks ago today, two weeks ago today, the first time in history that the symbol of dominance over the black people, over African-Americans, was paraded, as you see in this picture, through the Capitol building. Here's a picture of uh, uh, Dylan Roof. He's the one, of course, the mass murderer who killed uh, the worshiping blacks in Charleston, South Carolina. This is a picture of Dylan when he was a, just a teenager holding the Confederate flag in his left hand and a heavy pistol in his right hand. Um, of course, it reminds us of the other photograph, historic photograph of him uh, just before uh, he went, went to Charleston to murder the black people as they were playing, praying. Here, uh, these are Capitol police officers with their guns drawn, trying to keep the marauders out of the Senate and the House. Um, Here's uh, another group of the marauders with another Confederate flag pouring through the corridors. Here's the gallery, both in the Senate and the House. The gallery had, uh, you see people lying on the floor face down um, and the senators were hurried out just one minute before the intruders burst in. Here's one Capitol Police officer talking with a group of the uh, rioters. By the way, this fellow with the Viking horns, very, uh, quite a striking figure. He has been arrested. Every day, more and more uh, leaders uh, of the, of the uh, assailants have been identified and arrested. Here's another, and this person's also been arrested. The fellow who was in uh, rated Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi's uh, uh, office and, and the Senate chamber itself where he has grabbed this, the rostrum, the podium from which Nancy Pelosi addressed the House of Representatives. Here is the police officer, the Capitol Police officer who was killed in the riot. So here's everyone else. His name is uh, Brian Sicknick. 
and he was attacked by three men, attacked a fellow with a fire extinguisher who smashed and battered the uh, officer who died the next day as a result. Here's an extraordinary scene of a few Capitol Police officers and this uh, rioter walking in front of the policeman with his arms up in a victory sign. Um, this, this picture reminds us of the fact that, um, well, first, before we get to him, um, the number two on the list of historic events that happened, number two would be that Joe Biden was replacing a president who has been twice impeached and had desperately attempted to remain in the White House. First time in American history for that. Number three, the Capitol, this is the first time in history that the Capitol looked like a war zone during the inauguration. We had something like 24,000 National Guard troops, high fences all around circling a huge area of central Washington, DC. All of that was the first time. Um, and as we witnessed about six hours ago, um, the first time a woman and a black woman has ever been inaugurated as vice president of the United States. Um, Kamala Harris was in wonderful form this morning, but that's an enormous milestone in American history. And that's only one of several things that would, that would go down in history as a major event that happened today. Um, and number five is this illustrating in this picture, the violent storming of the Capitol building put on full display for the nation and the world, the difference in how police um, deal with protesters. Here we have rioters in a deadly assault on the US Capitol and the uh, Capitol Police are standing around observing. In other words, how do the police deal with white people when they demonstrate or even riot? They get treated gently. We've seen, we've seen uh, rioters holding hands with police, Capitol Police officers walking down the steps and virtually none of them being arrested they were told now just uh, just be good and go home, not even arrested. We saw a picture of a police, Capitol Police officer taking a selfie picture with a rioter. Uh, now contrast that, compare that with when, a, when blacks carry out a peaceful demonstration, a protest march, they are frequently, usually greeted with tear gas, tasers, rubber bullets, stun guns. Um, this was every African-American watching this was very, very clearly understood the symbolism that the white people get gently treated during riots, uh, protest marches, and black people get tear gassed and rubber bullets and even killed. Uh, now, a list of major historic events. Number six is, this is, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead here. Oh, I'm gonna insert this. We have the Capitol building in, in Olympia, Washington, Washington State Capitol. And at the same time, the same day, January 6th, it didn't get as much publicity, of course, because of the, the uh, storming in Washington uh, was so overwhelming. But uh, rioters in Olympia stormed through the gates, 
to the governor's mansion, which you see in beautiful, is the beautiful state uh, governor's mansion in this picture. And uh, the, by the way, the gates were, they're being replaced by more sturdy gates. But uh, the governor, Jay Inslee here, and his wife were in residence at the time. The, uh, the uh, intruders did not storm into the governor's mansion, but nonetheless, they took over the grounds uh, and the leader has been identified and arrested since then. Okay, getting back to historic event number six. This is the map of the state of Georgia. And it's the first time that a black, this gentleman, uh, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, the first black American to be elected to the US Senate ever. Um, Georgia, a former Confederate state. And finally, today is, is being sworn in as the first black senator from the state of Georgia. An enormous event, an enormous moment in American history. And, and that it was swallowed up because the next day was January the 6th, the riot. Um, <clears throat> At number six on my list. Number seven, um, the same election uh, in Georgia, two Democrats were elected. Of course, John Ossoff also, besides Raphael Warren, two Democrats were elected who, um, and the effect of that was enormous. It meant that uh, the Republican dominated Senate was flipped over and now Democrats control the US Senate. Um, and that event was basically swallowed up by the news of the storming in Washington. Number eight on my list, um, this election, for the first time in history, no, no, not the first time, the first time in about a hundred years where a, a one-term president, where Trump lost, since, since uh, Herbert Hoover back in the election of 18, 1932. So in 1932, Herbert Hoover lost the election to Franklin Roosevelt. So um, one sitting president lost the presidency, lost the House of Representatives, lost the Senate all in one fell swoop. Uh, Trump was the first one to achieve that accomplishment in uh, almost a century. So those are eight historic events, any one of which um, would have been a notable moment in American history and they all happened this week and today. Actually, you could add a ninth one, the peaceful transference of power. Um, ever, since, uh, the, every, ever since Abraham, even James Buchanan, this was 150, about 160 years ago, President James Buchanan, 15th president, who's usually ranked the worst of all presidents, um, he rode with Abraham Lincoln, the president-elect, in a horse-drawn carriage from the White House down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol. That was in 1861. Um, so, and today, it was not a peaceful transfer of power because Trump never admitted that he kept insisting still has insisted that he won the election. Um, so that's another historic moment took place today. Um, 
All right. What we're going to do now is change. I wanted to spend time to illustrate what an important day in history is today. So it's worth be worth of us becoming aware. Um, becoming aware of how important today we are all fortunate to be alive and witnessing this extraordinary series of historic moments. Um, uh, it's worth being aware of all these historic events that have come come to pass on the same fortnight, the same day. Now we're changing subjects appreciably. Um, as um, I'm going back to the pictures here, uh, as we learned last time, one of the points of the 1619 project was to start telling the full truth of black history of African American history. And so right now, I'm going to describe one event uh, in 1873. This is just eight years after the Civil War ended. Um, um, that happened in Colfax, Louisiana. But this is a, this is one of the episodes in American history that uh, you didn't learn in school. So part of the full history of African Americans that you did not learn in school, we're going to share one of them right now. It was the uh, a historic massacre in Colfax, Louisiana. Um, Uh, here you see the state of Louisiana. Colfax is a town, small town. I don't have an arrow to point, but it's straight. Uh, it's almost right in the center of the state of Louisiana. Colfax is a small town. It's so small it didn't even make this map, the National Ge Geographic map of the United States. But something extraordinary happened here in the heart of Louisiana in 1873. This was a tiny town uh, surrounded by cotton plantations uh, for a very long time. Still is some cotton grown there. It's located right on the Red River. You can see it comes down from the northwest to the southeast. The Red River flows into the Mississippi River. Uh, so there is Colfax, Louisiana. And an extraordinary event happened. It was discovered when a, um, a riverboat, a Mississippi riverboat, pulled into the dock, the Red River, uh, at the Colfax. It was after dark, and uh, passengers got out and started walking pretty much in the dark, stumbling over dead bodies. There were dozens and dozens of Black residents who had been. Uh, bludgeoned to death, shot to death, burned to death. In fact, the courthouse was still smoldering uh, where many had been burned to death. So the witnesses found most of these bodies face down. And this is a quote. They had been shot almost to pieces. Others other bodies had been mutilated, bludgeoned, and uh, burned to death in the courthouse. Um, by the way, Louisiana, Colfax did not have a county courthouse, did not have a county courthouse, and why not? Because Louisiana does not have counties. Louisiana has parishes. So the parish courthouse uh, was still smoldering. And I want to take a, a brief side trip to illustrate um, why Louisiana 
New Orleans are basically, they began in the French culture. This map of uh, colonial North America, all that blue is French territory from uh, Quebec and Montreal up on the St. Lawrence, down the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi, all of that area belonged to the French, uh, albeit very sparsely populated. New Orleans for some time uh, was French speaking, um, had French ruled by French laws. Um, the uh, code, the, in fact, to this day, Louisiana is the only state of the 50 that has a different legal system. All the other 49 states have, are based on the English common law, English legal system. Louisiana, on the other hand, is based on the Napoleonic code, French law. So um, the legal system, the political system of a uh, state being divided up by parishes and not counties makes uh, Louisiana really interesting and differ in many ways from the rest of the country. Um, even their language still here, this is, this, sign, this is a welcome sign to a festival, a crawfish festival in Brobridge, Louisiana. Um, Soyez les bienvenus à la fête des écrivains, which translated means, you all are welcome to the crawfish festival done every year. And the, here people are eating, you, you get ba five pound bags of crawfish, peel them and eat them. It's a very interesting place. Even the band playing sing French Cajun songs and people, people are dancing. And right here, this fascinating arena is the race, the crawfish race. People bet big money on which uh, crawfish, there are about 12 of them, it looks like, is gonna cross the finish line, which is to get outside the circle. <laughs> Anyway, bottom line is French is still spoken in many of the towns down in the Bayou, uh, Creole French, uh, in places like Brobridge here, which is just due west of New Orleans. So in short, that's why the courthouse in Colfax is not a county courthouse. Um, so what had happened, there was a this is a, a picture of President Ulysses Grant, who was reelected in the same year. So the year was 1870, the election was 1872. Uh, Ulysses Grant was elected and no problem in, in the Northern states at all. But in uh, Southern states, like in Louisiana, the election was total pandemonium. There was outrageous ballot box stuffing. Uh, there was intimidation of black voters. Um, uh, beatings of blacks to keep them away from the polls. Um, but in the, the outcome was extraordinary. This, of course, was um, uh, blacks were voting because of the, uh, they had been freed eight years earlier by the 13th Amendment. Um, so the blacks, black majority voters won the election so the Blacks, uh, including the governor of the state, the Blacks in, in, uh, installed a uh, Black governor, uh, the mayors, and Colfax was a poster place for um, the mayor, city council, all were former slaves. Eight years earlier, they'd been, they'd been slaves, and uh, now they're freedmen taking up political offices <clears throat> but what was the reaction from the whites, uh, white society could not accept this. And it was a huge revolution, of course, to have former slaves freed and now electing, uh, elected to public office. So whites rebelled in a violent revolt um, and came armed with weapons from large uh, from all around Louisiana. 
um, and started. Anyway, the, the whites also provoked. Uh, they had their, they proposed their own candidates as winners in this election. So it was a highly disputed election. And what was so interesting what happened, both sides um, chose a governor, elected a governor, and both of them had inaugurations. Um, you had a black governor and a white governor. And in Colfax, basically all the public officials were blacks. Um, uh, there was inaugural balls for both. And finally, it, uh, a federal court, a federal court because the army of occupation, the Union Army was still dominating the South uh, by martial law. And a federal judge proclaimed that the, the black favored candidates had won the election. Well, that was, that horrified uh, many of the white, white supremacists in uh, Louisiana. So they descended on the town of Colfax and um, turned into a feverish mob, a murderous, in a murderous frenzy. Um, the attacks, and they had, they outnumbered the blacks. Uh, and also they, they were totally, the blacks were totally outgunned. Um, so the, many of the blacks were shot to death, bludgeoned, and the, the rest of the blacks uh, went into the county courthouse, barricaded it to try to defend themselves. But the white mob set fire to the courthouse. Uh, the courthouse was burning and some of the blacks, and of course they were suffocating from the smoke and dying. Uh, whenever a black came out the front door to escape, they were shot to death um, and or bludgeoned to death. So the large majority were burned alive in the courthouse, not the county courthouse, but the parish courthouse. Okay. Um, now, now we're gonna go to, we're going to the town of Colfax here. Now here's a historic marker. It's uh, near the courthouse. I'm going to read this. On this site, okay, it's the Colfax riot. On this site <clears throat> occurred the Colfax riot in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. This event on April the 13th, 1873, marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. This event marked the end of carpetbag northern northerners misrule in the South. Of course, the carpetbaggers, the called carpetbaggers, not only northerners who came and took over uh, southerners, southerners' property and mines and logging mills and things like that, but also a lot of young. Uh, people from the north, Massachusetts particularly, came down as teachers teaching uh, the blacks to help them get literate. Uh, medical help uh, came, that was all. They were described as carpetbaggers. Now in, in Colfax here, we're gonna go to the cemetery. Uh-oh, not working. Um, the next picture is this one right here. Yeah, in the cemetery, um, there's a 12 foot obelisk and it says in the memory of the heroes, Stephen Decatur Parish, James West Hadnot, Sidney Harris. We're gonna take this, oops. Hmm. Okay, these gentlemen fell it's a little hard to read the monument, but what it says is, um, 
This monument was erected to the memory of the heroes who fell in the Colfax riot fighting for white supremacy. Repeating, the heroes, this is a 12-foot marble obelisk, to the heroes who fell in the Colfax riot fighting for white supremacy. The historical marker and this obelisk are standing there today in Colfax, Louisiana. <clears throat> um, I picture here the Supreme Court because um, a lot of the about 90, 93 or 94 of the mob that killed blacks were known and, the, and that many, and nearly a hundred of them were prosecuted uh, under federal law. But because of it, after a series of, um, of court cases, it turned out that none of the 90, 90 some uh, killers were convicted or paid a penalty. Um, none of them were held accountable. Now, if you're interested, oh, by the way, and uh, well, it shows the deep, uh, a map of the deep south and the border south. Now, this is the book, if, if you're interested in following up on this episode, which virtually no Americans knew about until the publication of this book, The Day Freedom Died, <clears throat> The Colfax Massacre, The Supreme Court, and The Betrayal of Reconstruction, a book by Charles Lane. Um, so as a result of, and by the way, uh, Jim, there was basically open season on blacks. Um, word spread uh, after the court cases were finished and none of the perpetrators were held accountable. None of them went to jail. Word spread immediately through the Southern states that you see on the map here, uh, that numerous blacks Freedmen were openly killed, massacred in Colfax, Louisiana, and no one had been held accountable. No one was held accountable. In other words, the white Southerners could get away with murder. They could get away with murder. Um, and as a result, General Phil Sheridan in 1875, this was 10 years after the Civil War ended. Of course, there were Union armies still occupying some, there were not enough, not enough uh, Union regiments, but Phil Sherrod reported to the Capitol in Washington that there were 2,141 Negroes had been killed by whites in Louisiana alone. The same report. Phil Sheridan reported there were 2,115 wounded since the end of the Civil War. And, and yet no one was punished for these crimes. So <clears throat> why this, this massacre in Colfax was a very important moment in American history which you did not learn about in school. Why was it so important? Because the Southerners learned that they could uh, murder, lynch blacks and not be, in most cases, not be held accountable, that they could get away with murder. So, 
It's a very important episode in Louisiana because from that episode, you can draw a straight line from Colfax to many, many lynchings of blacks, the mass, mass lynchings for which nobody was account held accountable. Um, the race riots in Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, the Tulsa race riots in 1921, criminal brutality unleashed on the blacks in Selma, Birmingham in the 1960s, um, police violence in Ferguson, Missouri, Charlotte, North Carolina, right up to the present. So the episode, which we did not learn in school about the massacre of blacks in, um, in uh, Colfax, Louisiana, was a very important monumental moment in American history. All right. Uh, now we're finishing a few minutes early, but uh, we can go ahead and go to the uh, questions and observations now. Oh, I should have mentioned, did Deirdre mention it? Uh, you can't talk, but you can, you will have written in on the chat feature there. So if you have questions, um, write those in. So Deirdre or Jim, do you have any of the questions written yet? The questions or comments, observations? Uh, yeah. Just one question so far, Bill, um, from Tim Spellman. He asks, has there been any attempts to remove the obelisk at Colfax? As far as I know, the latest I checked, no, there have been no, uh, you, you'd expect some kind of a groundswell in opposition, but uh, uh, it has not been removed as far as I know. Mm -hmm. That's the only question so far. Well, maybe okay. while we're waiting for some questions, I'll just uh, thank you again, Bill. It was mm -hmm. great, really interesting, especially, you know, this historical day, so pertinent. Um, just a reminder to everybody, you can use the same link for every class, but if you want to receive the outline, you'll need to register because it only goes out to all the registrants unless you're part of Bill's uh, mailing group and then he sends it out, I think separately. Right, Bill? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I see Wendy Watts Pearson has joined us. <laughs> um, Julianne Seaman. Hi, Julianne. Oh, Granny is here. Lois McLean. Hello, Lois. <laughs> okay, so I'm seeing another question. I, th I think I can actually read it. Uh, I, I always understood the term carpetbagger was a negative term, but it sounds like some at least were trying to help Blacks in the South. Yes, um, carpetbagger is a term originated from the Southerners. Uh, for Northerners would come down with, in a rush, traveling light with just a carpet bag and uh, moving in to take over confiscated land from the plantation owners and take over some of the natural resources, as I mentioned, uh, logging and and uh, sawmills, some of the mines were taken over by Northerners. Uh, but, uh, and those, that's who the carpetbaggers were uh, intended to malign. And it was a totally different uh, group who came down, kind of almost like the Peace Corps or America Corps, where you have uh, volunteers from, especially Boston, Massachusetts, New England, came down uh, and they knew it was dangerous. In fact, it was very dangerous um, to be teaching all black students, adults and students, particularly uh, young people uh, to read and write uh, and learn about their new rights under the 13th, 14th amendments 
on the 15th. Um, by the way, in uh, the same year the Civil War ended, in December of 1865, the Ku Klux Klan <clears throat> was originated, it was born, started in Tennessee by a Confederate officer, um, Nathan uh, Forrest, and he became the first grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. But they were, they were organized because actually, not just to terrorize blacks and keep them from voting and keeping the blacks in a subservient position for they were able to do that for the next hundred years. Um, but also that what they really started, what they were so di di disturbed by the uh, carpetbaggers coming in and taking over some of their businesses. So the Ku Klux Klan um, began and then they continued to to carry out their policing duties. I should mention that uh, from the beginning, 400 years ago, from the beginning of slavery, whites in Virginia and the South were deputized, basically deputized. It was one of their civic duties to be on slave patrols. So all the whites were responsible for serving on slave patrols to catch blacks violating curfews or runaway slaves. So that became part of our DNA in, in, our, in this culture. The Ku Klux Klan, where does the word come from? Ku Klux. The, the, the first two, the Ku Klux, comes from a Greek word, Ku Klux, which means a circle. So it was like a, intended to be a secret society that wore the white gowns and hoods to hide their identity. It was a secret circle. By the way, the Greek word, well, if you're familiar with Homer's Odyssey, the Cyclops, the huge monster with one large eye the front of, in the center of his forehead, he was a Cyclops. And the word Cyclops comes, is based on Kuklops, meaning a circle, a wheel eye, a circle eye. Um, Ku Klux and then the Klan goes back to a Gaelic word, a Celtic, Irish, Gaelic word, which means clan. Uh, so the, that's where the term Ku Klux Klan <clears throat> comes from. Any other comments or observations, Jim? Some other questions here. Um, Peter Bauer asked if there was a black senator during early Re reconstruction and several other people were curious about this. Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> During Reconstruction, the 12 years was first, the first uh, eight or 10 years of the Reconstruction, um, when the Southerners were not, they were disbarred from voting. And positive from the viewpoint of, of uh, black history, Native American history, a lot of really competent uh, statesmen local and federal uh, were elected and uh, did a good job. South Carolina had a, a large slate, but no, Georgia is, and several of the Southern states sent representatives to Congress that were former slaves, blacks. Georgia is one state that never sent uh, a senator um, a black senator. Um, it's not the only southern conf former Confederate states, but no, Georgia never sent uh, a senator who was black. That makes Georgia especially notable today, where we have the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock is now a U.S. senator, the first U.S. senator from Georgia. And then uh, Julia, uh, Julian Seaman asked, uh, what's the difference between a parish and a county? Oh, um, in the French, in, in, uh, in the United States, as uh, when the colonies and became states, they divided the colony or state into counties because in England, that was a subdivision of the regions were counties. 
in Ireland, of course, also ruled, ruled by the English for 800 years. Um, uh, and it's an English term, an English political uh, unit and the states were divided into manageable smaller regions, but in Louisiana, it's basically the same political subdivision, just with a different division and a different law code. So in Louisiana, the parishes there um, are equivalent to the counties, uh, but they have a different law code and uh, it's just following the, the French terminology. And then there's a question from Julie Codd. Uh, is the KKK aligned with churches in, in their ceremonies and dress? Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I have to stop and think. And not that I know of it. Um, hmm. No, they're more, the organization of the Ku Klux Klan is more based on uh, civic duty to do police duties. Uh, uh, police and so it's more based on the uh, police civic obligations they had rather than religious. Now there could be some, hmm, there could be some connection with uh, with uh, religious services, but I, not that I know of. You're not going to pursue that further. It's interesting. And then there's a couple of comments on on the term carpetbagger, I'll read them here. Uh -huh. uh, one of them is, I always understood, this is from uh, uh, Vanman. Uh, I always understood the term carpetbagger was a negative term, but it sounds like some at least were trying to help blacks in the South. Yeah. And then another comment, as I understand, this from Julianne Seaman, as I understand carpetbaggers, they were set they were sent to the South to punish white Southerners for their part in the war. This enraged the Southerners who waged war on the blacks as retribution. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, the uh, carpetbagger term is only applied to the ones who came down to despoil uh, the resources of the South. Um, and Julianne's comment is an interesting one um, because some of the carpetbaggers came down to punish and try to take confiscated land from uh, the former plantation owners. Um, yeah, so I, I should have made a, a clearer distinction when I mentioned the term carpetbaggers uh, because the ones who came down to to offer positive help, volunteers, teaching and medical uh, nurses, doctors, um, was totally positive in their motivation. The carpetbaggers are the ones who <clears throat> were not uh, <laughs> le legitimately motivated. Mm. Any other ops comments? Uh Julie further modified her comment or her question about the KKK, whether or not it was aligned with uh, churches in their ceremonies, etc., to include the idea of a burning cross. Whether that oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. The uh, why did the Ku Klux Klan use a burning cross as a symbol? Hmm. That obviously is a religious symbol, but. Uh, I really don't, I can't explain that any further. The connection would be a good, good assignment to look that up, to track that further. No other comments or thoughts? Um, there's a couple more. Um, Rick and Karen, uh, Say the KKK practice dates to medieval times. As Scots burned crosses as symbols of defiance of military rivals. Well, that's interesting. So in the Middle Ages, Scottish burned crosses as symbol. Could you repeat that again? Symbols of what? Uh, 
the Scots burned crosses as a symbol of defiance of military rivals. Oh, that's interesting because the Scottish clans are notorious for fighting against each other and then fighting against the kings of England at times and defeating them. Um, huh. I, I imagine that is one of the origins of the burning cross because uh, well, the Scottish clans almost constantly at war with, with other clans, their neighbors, and they chose to use the cross, the, burn, the burning cross as a symbol. Well, it's kind of a natural, the shape of a cross is a, uh, makes a really good symbol uh, to light up at night instead of just, uh, just a single pole. <laughs> And then se several other people uh, expanded on that and said that uh, my understanding, this is from Julianne again, my mm -hmm. understanding is that KKK embraced a kind of Christianity similar to the Crusades in their racism and anti-Semitism. And then yeah. Rick and Karen also said the, uh, they also burned crosses to rally troops to action. And uh, Al Blakesley noted that wasn't just in the South, but the KKK was also in the Menhow Valley. Yeah, to follow up on Al's comment, there's a, I was planning, I'll be using that photograph uh, at a later time, a later class, but there's a photograph in the night from the 1920s. It was a Ku Klux Klan convention in Twisp, a huge gathering. Well, it was, for, I would say at least 40, members all dressed in white, the white gown and the white uh, cone hat, which in the Ku Klux, of course, there were virtually no blacks in the Meto, almost none in the county. The Ku Klux Klan had, from the 1920s, that era, they also uh, waged attacks on Catholics, um, a lot of other groups, I think Jewish, um, but several other minorities. Um, <clears throat> so it was, it was very startling to see a picture taken at Twisp in the 1920s of a con convention of Ku Klux Klaners. But getting back to the first, the early part of the question. Um, oh yeah, Julianne is right. And I know she's, uh, she's a teacher and she's well informed um, about this. Um, the Southerners, most of the Southerners were pretty devout Christians, or I don't know the statistics, were devout Christians, but they're, they, uh, they use the Bible in Virginia, principally uh, Anglican, Episcopalian, but the Baptists and others further south. Um, the part of the part of the religion of the southern the Christian religion included a lot of quotes from the Bible, which confirmed human slavery as legitimate. And of course, the Hebrew people did have slaves. Um, they're not particularly known for that. Other cult, other contemporary cultures, had more slaves, more uh, per capita. But the Jewish people did have slaves, and one of the one of the uh, exhortations was, "Treat your slaves well." And so the Southerners in the United States used quotations like that from the Bible to justify human slavery. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you. Thank you for several of you uh, for following up on that. So. Uh, so the burning cross was a symbol of their religion, of the, of the Southerners' belief that slavery was legitimate part of the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew and uh, Christian religion. Yes, thank you, Julianne, especially. And then I had an observation. Um, this, this is my own bill. Um, in, uh -huh. in a counterpoint to the 1619 project, just Monday on Martin Luther King's birthday, the White House 
released the 1776 commission results. It was announced several months earlier and it probably went unnoticed by most people, but I, I actually got around to reading it last night and finished it this morning. And it's a pretty incendiary document. It attempts to rewrite basically the history of race in the United States. Um, it calls slavery a regrettable but uh, unavoidable situation and uh, goes on to equate the, uh, the greatness in the United States due to white men and God. And uh, it goes on from there. It's, it's pretty awful. Uh, I, I went and looked for it about an hour ago and it's already been removed from the White House oh website. God. That's disappointing. Yeah, I'm sure you. I'm sure you could uh, Google around and find it. It's it's a lengthy document and, and it's a it's a pretty sad statement. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 40, 41 pages. I think is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I know about it. It was released two days ago. Yes. Uh, yeah, the 1776 project. It's an obvious response to uh, the New York 1619 1619 project. And what I, I, I know a little bit about it already. I've been planning to read it, haven't had time. I'm definitely gonna read it. Um, but what I do know about it is uh, there are, uh, oh, what about a dozen or 15 names of those who contributed to it. Um, of those, not one of them is a historian. Right. They basically are uh, followers of Trump um, who are attempting to propaganda writers? I, mean, I don't want to malign them too badly, but uh, basically, propaganda writers who are attempting to rewrite history, to rewrite uh, the contributions of the blacks out of American history. Um, so it's uh, it has not been there. An article from uh, yesterday's Seattle Times, which I have, um, thanks to John Hawley. Um, the um, it is not by virtually all the historians who have read it have the same conclusion that it's no, nothing to be taken seriously at all. It's a uh, it's flagrant piece of uh, propaganda.